As people of faith, we cherish life. God the Creator gave us life, and He affirms the importance of life. And so we, as followers of Jesus Christ, as Christians, are called to affirm life in the importance of it. One of the great themes in the Bible is the fact that while life is valuable, it's brief. It doesn't last for a long period of time. In fact, one of the psalmists writes that we are given 70 years, and if our strength is good, maybe 80. But in the end, all of us will face death. Now, of course, we have the hope of eternal life, but our lives here on earth, they're limited. And a lot of metaphors and images are used to describe how brief life actually is. The briefness of life is compared to smoke that comes out of a chimney, or a shadow that vanishes as the sun fades, or a chaff that blows in the wind and is gone, or like a runner who runs a race with great speed is seen and is gone. We also see that the Bible refers to life being short as an eagle swoops to catch its prey. It takes next to no time for that to take place. We also see the image, a bygone image, of a weaver at a loom sending the shuttle across and how short of a time that takes and life is compared to that. But perhaps two of the most powerful images are those of the wild flowers that are here one day and gone tomorrow and perhaps the most powerful image of all, that of the mist or fog that exists. And this time of year, we see fog or mist because the temperatures are changing. A lot of times if you're traveling in the mornings and you see water around, the water may be a warmer temperature than the cooler air around it. And this causes fog and mist to exist around that spot. But in just a short period of time, the sun comes out, it burns off the mist, and it's gone. And our lives are described like that. For sure, God doesn't want us to have some morbid view of, of death, of the brevity of life, and yet He wants us to take notice of it because it's reality. We only get to live so long on earth. We only have a certain amount of time to make a difference, and we never know when our number gets called up. We don't know the time when we cross over into death. And so we're always called to be prepared. But not only to be prepared, but to be considering what God wants us to do with the life that He's given to us and to use it to the fullest. There's a powerful passage in James chapter 4, that practical book 
where Jesus' half-brother writes in really practical terms how we're supposed to live out our faith, how it's practically supposed to look like. He cares about the substance of our life, not just the beliefs, but putting it into action. And in chapter 4 of James, we read about the brevity of life. If you have a Bible with you, turn to James chapter 4, and we'll start in the 13th verse. Again, it's James chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. This is the word of the Lord for us today. Now listen, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast and brag, all such boasting is evil. Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. It's important for us to make clear what James is and isn't saying in this passage. He's not saying that we shouldn't make plans. He's not saying that we shouldn't engage in business. He's not saying that we shouldn't think about tomorrow. Instead, it's easy to allow our practical decisions to slip into the realm where we forget about God and all we consider is about earning and doing our job and succeeding and climbing the corporate ladder and achieving something for ourselves. And James throws the brakes on that idea and says, you need to check in with God and make sure that you're doing His will, not yours. Specifically, James calls out boasting. And this is a notorious thing for those who are striving to achieve the best that they possibly can. To boast, to be putting a lot of pride in what they are achieving. And oftentimes, this leads us to ignore what God has enabled us to do. A couple of things that I want us to focus on. The first is that James points out the merchant, the business person, going off to a city for a year or so and making money. There's nothing wrong with making money. We need money to be able to purchase the things like food and, and houses and um, our utilities and other necessities of life. But the problem is that so often when we get caught up in making money, we forget about God. Remember Jesus saying that you have to choose either God or money? That you can't serve both of those? And so, unless money is actually understood under the guidance of God and used in godly ways, money ends up controlling us. And if you think about the average American today, we are obsessed about money. We never feel like we have quite enough. And so we strive more and more to make increasing amounts of money. That in and of itself is not a problem. It's when we put our stock, our faith, our trust in that money, which can vanish in a heartbeat, and our very lives at that too, that we run into problems. So James is saying, plans are fine, but when you focus on money to the exclusion of God and His will, you're making a mistake, and in fact, you're sinning. Notice also the way that James nuances what's important in this passage. He says, if the Lord wills something, then we should do this or do that. That means that we're diligently praying to God, we're, we're reading the Word of God, and interpreting it and applying it in our lives, we're listening to the guidance of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We're allowing Him to direct our paths instead of informing God, this is what we're going to do. And oh, by the way, we would really appreciate if you would bless it. That has the equation completely backwards. We start with God and what He wants us to do. What His will is. 
and know that He will bless that because He's called us to do it rather than informing Him of our intentions. Specifically, in verse 16, James calls out boasting, this idea of pride. It's really easy when we have successes, especially as it relates to money and business. We get a promotion at a job. If we're a business owner, we have a really good year. To take all the credit and forget that God gives us the very health to be able to do the job, the energy that's necessary to carry it out, the wisdom and the discernment to make decisions that are good and business-wise. And so when pride comes into the equation, we're doing things counter to what God wants us to do. And James doesn't mince his words here. He calls this boasting and pride evil. That is the exact opposite of what God stands for because God is good. I pause for a moment and consider in your own lives, is there pride that's going unchecked that needs to be addressed? That needs to come under the Lordship of God? That needs to be corrected? And what steps can you take to ensure that change actually happens in your life. And finally, in verse 17, James says, if you know the good that you're called to do, whether it means that you get rich or not, and you don't do it, you have sinned. A lot of times, we look at sin as something that we do that's bad. You know, don't murder somebody. Don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal, those kinds of things. But here James sets the bar much, much higher. He says, if you know that God's calling you to do something, and you're engaging in something that inherently isn't bad, but it's not what God's called you specifically to do, you're still sinning because God is in control. That's the ultimate point. God is in charge, we are His servants. And the point of this passage really is not just about money. It's not just about making plans. It's not just about business. It's not just about striving. It's about who is in charge. Are we allowing God to be number one in our lives? Are we allowing Him to be in charge? I like what one commentator says in summarizing this passage. He says, man proposes, but God disposes. Because God wants to clear the clutter of things that are about us and have us focus on His will because He knows what's best. He also can see the beginning to the end. He has eternal purposes in mind. And we lose out along with the people around us when we choose to ignore God and His ways. If we go all the way back to Genesis, to the creation narrative, Adam and Eve, the original sin committed by them was that they didn't want to follow God's way. And interestingly enough, when they took matters into their own hands, when they disregarded the single command that God gave to them not to eat from the tree of good and evil, they lost their immortality and had to embrace their mortality. And that struggle is not something unique to Adam and Eve. It's true for every human being. It's a real struggle every single day. Who's in charge? Is it you or is it God? There is no doubt that God gives us a lot of autonomy to make decisions within the grand scheme of things. He allows us to make specific decisions related to what we do and don't do. But God regularly gives us His marching orders. Sometimes He gives us very specific orders, unique callings, right down to the nitty-gritty details, and we're called to follow them. 
And the challenge before us today is not only to consider how short life is, because God wants to achieve a lot through your life, but in who we're allowing to be in charge of that life. You know, when we were little babies and small children, the world revolved around us. And as we grow older and mature and become adults, hopefully life becomes less about us and more about others and certainly about God. And yet I know countless adults where life is all about them. And this passage in James challenges that at its core. Because we never know when our end comes here on the face of the earth. My prayer for you and for all of us today is that we would allow God to have his rightful place in our lives. That we wouldn't be boastful in what we achieve, but that we would give credit to God above. That we wouldn't become arrogant in thinking that we know what's best and ignoring God's commands in our lives. And ultimately that our lives would be a testimony to God's grace and his goodness and love. I pray that that will be true for all of us. May God bless you this day and beyond as you pursue him with all of your being. Amen. Allowing him to direct our paths rather than informing him, this is what we're doing, God. And oh, by the way, we would really like if you would bless it. And evil. They lost their immorality. They lost their immortality and had to embrace their mortality. God regularly gives us his marching orders, and it's up to us to obey them. And it's up to us to obey them. 